technology, with I think about innovation and being able to learn new stuff and being able to accommodate new discoveries into the everyday work and then like being um, flexible in reacting to the very difficult times that we have right now. So what I learned as a capacity builder for years because I was um, a person who was building capacity of NGOs when it comes to technology that most of us were not able, it wasn't the wheel that was lacking, it was not able to take one more thing and learn why we were just very, very tired. So this is how I came up with um, the initiative on uh, anti-burnout. Like I'm not that super passionate about burnout, but I'm actually quite passionate about innovation, creativity, and joy. But when we are all like zombies, it's very hard to get that. So that's why I'm taking care of burnout first, in order to be able uh, to be able to be creative and have real connections with people, and actually maybe trying new stuff when it comes to uh, when it comes to implementing change as like the big thing because we all work in different environments there are people that are working in open government there are people that are working with open data there are advocates for minority groups there are community builders local and national and in in european union on the european level so we're all different but there are some stuff that connects us as as activists volunteers and ngo professionals um still we're quite of a small group comparing to let's say first sector of, of administration and the second sector of, of business so uh so that's why the burnout and tech soap and innovation uh so my name is anna Culiverda. i was connected to NGO World since i don't know since i remember i am an activist at heart and it's just like this natural way of my personality <laughs> to do stuff. And this is how I am now an activist for other activists to fight burnout. Uh, what this, um, this webinar will be, it will be, let me just try to change the slides exactly. It will be about activists, not robots. This is a robot that is confused and quite just frozen in what he or she is. Uh, that will be a webinar that will cover both theory and practice and I would prefer to, to focus on practice but I don't want to skip theory that much so um, in the beginning especially if there are questions or you want to know more just tell us in the chat box and Maya will interrupt me and, and maybe like just ask me to elaborate on certain stuff. So as much as possible, I would prefer to, uh, to skip theory uh, but and, and go to practice, to solutions, to thinking how, what to do. But if you want me to stop at certain thing, just let me know. Um, okay, so let's start with the first pool. Uh, so for us to get to know, this is a personal question to you. So on the scale of one to 10, where do you find yourself uh, when it comes to burnout? Uh, so one is, I'm full of passion, but I want to learn just in case to prevent burnout. So then you have like one, two, three, four, and then five is, I suspect there might be something here maybe a bit of FOBO. So FOBO is a uh, fear of burning out, which because like many medias are right now reporting on how we are all uh, in danger of burnout. So that's, that's what can be the, so, so we have FOMO, fear of missing out. There's also FOBO, which is fear of burning out. And of course the tent, I just want everybody to leave me alone for about two years. And this is basically how I felt some time ago. So two years is how much time took me to come back to life. And um, this, is, um, this is why I put it as like, the worst possible. Maya, are we? We are, yeah, we are eight people voted for now. So if there are any late 
vote. Yes. Attendees of the poll, please. Go ahead, vote. To the poll, and we'll give you 10 more seconds. Oh, somebody raised their hand. You can put the questions in the chat box. Yeah, if you have any trouble with the... Oh, Claudia and Tatiana, you're answering in the chat. Uh, I guess that's because maybe you don't see the poll. If you go, if you watch, or look at the panel below, you'll see um, something called polls and then you can click it and then you can vote there. Okay, we're up to 12 answers. There is something wrong with the software because many people can't find, can't uh, find the, poll. the poll. Yeah. Okay. We are trying it for the first time and has all the troubles. We apologize, uh, not in advance, right now for the troubles. Um, um, in the poll, okay. Exactly, yeah, some of you don't see it. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. I'm ending it now and uh, we'll just see the results. So the, uh, also adding yours from the chat box. I'll just, I'll just do it manually. Um, so the most popular answer is actually uh, the middle one, I suspect there might be something here, maybe a bit of FOBO. Um, there are, the next one is uh, number eight, so people closer to, uh, I just want everybody to leave me alone. Um, but the, but uh, the rest of you is more on this, uh, closer to the, uh, between the first and the fifth um, uh, point, so. Which is fantastic which is absolutely brilliant because if you're closer to um, not burning out, uh, meaning like you can prevent it, it's always easier to prevent than to heal. So that's already great news. But I don't want to, but I don't want to admit it because there are people, uh, some, some of you who, who haven't seen the poll are adding your answers now and some people are adding, but it's definitely 10 for me. So yeah, <laughs> probably half and half. Um, so let's keep that in mind. I will uh, share some um, like self-assessment uh, tool uh, later on so you can um, maybe go deeper with that uh, at home. Mm, so let's go further with the webinar. So what is burnout? Uh, burnout is a state of exhaustion and frustration. This is the moment when you like, feel I don't want to do anything and I'm angry about it. So, but this is like this moment of being quite passive about it. This is the moment when I don't see a possibility of change. Um, it's caused uh, by dedication to something, like to a lifestyle, to a relationship, to, to work. And for activists, I would say the cause is important, like the mission, what I find important in the world to change. But the issue is that we are losing fuel while there is no expected gratification. And for some people, it might be, um, it might be money, obviously. For many people, money is important. And, uh, but some of us are working for money and some of us are getting money for work and also are working for something else. And especially volunteers, we're finding something else as our fuel to get. So if you're not getting it, uh, that's the moment when uh, this dedication doesn't pay off, basically. And that is the moment when, it, if it takes time, we, um, that, that we get to the state of burnout. How does it look in practice? So the symptoms of burnout. There, are the, there is the group of emotional and uh, psychophysical. So this is how our body feels and how our own mind feels. There can be lack of energy. It, it doesn't need to be all together and all the time. So it can, it can be lack of energy. It can be insomnia. It can be depression. Uh, the interesting part of it is that it seems impossible to regenerate. So when you go to sleep 
uh, in a state like of uh, completely lack of lacking of energy and then you wake up with the same level of energy and then you think you will never get back to real level of energy that might be one of the symptoms of, of burnout and also this aversion to taking new projects like everything is too much and i want to just uh raise a big red flag here when you experience um those um those symptoms please go and consult the doctor like try make that uh, making the tests even the basics one just don't make sure that um this is not that might not be burnout. There are many other uh, causes that might co there, there are many other things that might cause depression, that might cause insomnia, that might cause lack of energy. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's burnout. Um, so let's go further. Um, the other group of the symptoms is sense of uh, lack of efficiency. So that is basically how I felt few years ago, like two years ago, I felt like a trained monkey could do whatever I was doing. It was just not important, it was boring, and it was trivial. However, any new task or a project seemed too much. So it's a paradox. Like on one side, everything is too easy and boring. Uh, on the other side, like, please don't add anything more. And on top of everything, any change. So like me acting for changing that or the world changing as such, especially if, you, um, if you're an activist, seems impossible. So like it's, it's a defeat, sense of defeat, uh, which kind of freezes you in one place. It's very hard to, to break it. Um, then we have the personalization and disconnection. Uh, so uh, that can can be seen as just leave me in peace and feeling like being a machine. That happens especially to, to, to people that are working with other people, like with clients in needs, with patients. So there is no more empathy in, uh, in us because like, it, it's gone. But there is no energy to be empathetic. The only person I can be empathetic is, is myself, but mostly not in this good self-compassionate way. So there's a lot of passive aggressive for others and also for myself. And uh, this, is, um, this is kind of a triangle of how um, burnout can look like. I actually realized uh, quite recently that in the state of burnout, I bought this sweatshirt and I don't know if you can see, there is this sign, responsibilities makes me sick. That is exactly how I felt. This is from a teenager store, like store, uh, a store for teenagers. So I guess like that was a bit from a um, different state of mind. Uh, but this is how I felt, I just leave me alone. Are there any questions, Maya, at this moment? We just got a question, but maybe we uh, do you want to, uh, I'll read it. But I don't know if you want to answer it now or at the end, because the question is uh, general um, and it concerns burnout. What are the best ways to communicate about burnout with employers and colleagues without risking discrimination at work? I think we can discuss that later on, because I mm -hmm. think you'll talk sure. about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure, uh, I will uh, keep that in mind. Yep. Okay, so burnout is a combination of two factors and like this question is perfect uh, for this particular slide uh, because how it's being shown in the media recently, it's being shown as your individual responsibility. Uh, like you failed in a way, you or me, I failed. Uh, so, so it's my responsibility also to fix myself. Uh, but burnout is happening in a very specific external environment. So uh, this environment is just taking people that I might be prone to burnout, like we can see people with high qualification, very strong motivation, with ambitious goals, high expectations when starting. This is like having a perfect activist 
there is a lot of my friends from around Central and Eastern Europe and also around the globe in Code for All uh, community, for example. Super co high qualification, very strong motivation because they choose not to go into business or administration. They wanted to change the world. So the goals are ambition, ambitious and the expectations are high. But that th the same person in favorable conditions, they might try. They might be happy and they might actually be changing the world. While in a culture of work that is uh, taking advantage too much and not remembering that being rational, like good management is also or managing people's forces, that is, um, that is how burnout is happening. Burnout is not happening because I didn't take a bubble bath. Burnout is happening because we struggle with a lot of stress. And often the stress is caused by external, uh, external environment. Sometimes we can change something in the stress perception and we'll get to that later, but often we have very little control about it. So um, I, I just want to make it clear. If there is anything that you, can take from this particular webinar is don't blame yourself when it happens. It's not that you weren't not good of not not good enough of an activist. It's just we are operating in a very very hard conditions, and I will um, I will get to that um, later too. Um, so. Burnout is response to stress of an individual, obviously, to stressors in the environment, and it takes time. In order to burn out, we need a lot of time. We need to burn for a lot of time. So we might be losing fuel, and that is, um, so we, we might be losing fuel and not seeing that, because like we're oblivious to the blinking red light that, hey, stop, it's just killing you. It doesn't work, like maybe start, stop spinning. This is also because we are not being taught to listen to ourselves. We're being taught to um, feel bad if we feel bad. So we try not to feel bad and pretend that everything is all right. And if we feel bad, we feel like we failed. And we want to run away from this feeling, often lying to ourselves. So this is, uh, the time is crucial. It, it takes time. So if at one day you feel like, oh, this is not my day, that might not be a burnout yet. Uh, but if those days are repeating and repeating and then you go on vacations and then you come back in the same state and nothing is changing, that might be the burnout. So the time is an important factor. Um, so causes of burnout. Um, and this is big and Maya was quite um, shocked when we got here. So we... Every single research right now, especially positive psych psychology, is saying that we need meaning in life. We need to know that we have positive impact uh, in life. And uh, that what we do is useful and important, and who we are is useful and important. So this is like this loss of meaning um, in what we do as activists. Um, this might be a very big, uh, very big factor contributing as well uh, to, to, to burnout as like a big thing in our life. And now we are going to have another uh, question personal. I hope this time more people will see the polls because we have, uh, I have first the question, like, do you know what is your meaning of life? What drives you? Like, what makes you get up in the morning and just start doing stuff. And there is the, the answers are kind of descriptive. So like, yes, of course, hmm, probably, maybe, but I'm not really sure. And then I think I lost it somewhere. And then not at all anymore. And some people might say like, I don't think I ever had it. And I don't even want to think about it. And then like any other answer that comes to your mind. Oh, I can see more people can see um, the poll this time. 
Yes, yes, we are getting better with the polls. Amazing. But if you're having any trouble, obviously write in the um, write in your answer in the chat box, and I'll manually. Okay. Yeah, we're definitely getting there. We have 15 answers. 10 more seconds. Okay. Only three more. Just one last vote. Okay, I'm stopping it. Amazing. So it's pretty, pretty even, I guess. Um, there's a lot of people who have a sense of purpose and a meaning in their life. Because the two most popular answers are yes, of course. But also the other one is I think I lost it somewhere. There is, so why is it so important? Because in fighting burnout, meaning of life like the sense of meaning of life is like beyond importance like there, there is nothing n nothing more than can uh, that can uh, that can help you like there is nothing that can help you more uh, so the question for for you like to reflect on it um sorry uh, as maybe at home is more what is the relation of this meaning of life to your activism because different people are finding the meaning in different uh in different areas uh so like three big um groups let's say uh, of where to find the meaning is one is goals with legacy so like often this is the change i want to find the cure for aids i want to make sure that uh people with certain diseases are welcomed in the world i want to change something that also like this legacy often comes uh from um artistic creative um fields as well then many people find the meaning from the service to the divine it doesn't need to be connected to a certain god but it is a connection to something bigger than world it's as such and there is also a big group of people who find the meaning in being emotionally intimate with others. That goes with helping other groups, like it doesn't necessarily need parenting on, or having family, but this is the meaning for, for many people, when you can feel connection with other human beings. Uh, so if you feel like you don't know where is your, where is your meaning of life, that might be, uh, that might be uh, some groups to maybe investigate um, if that might apply to you. Um, so causes of burnout that are more specific a bit um, and there are definitely the causes of stress. Uh, so when it comes to stress and burnout we have six and this is um, this is um, Category, those are categories um, that uh, Professor Christina Maslach came with, and I think they are really applicable for activists. So we have um, mismatch in workload when there is too much, too, too fast, just, just basically it's never enough. And it's very often our reality in NGOs when this is a constant austerity. We need to be more than one person, like in our job as volunteers. We often need to know uh, more than three normal job positions and we need to do it fast and everything is just too much. Uh, the second uh, mismatch is mismatch in control, is the feeling of I have no control over what and how I do. This is not that often in NGOs, uh, let's say like just more informal groups, but in more, more formal organizations that might happen. This is often um, one of the signs of bad management uh, in, in organizations and anywhere else, um, where we're just, okay, so no, but I don't know why I'm doing it. I don't really know like 
why I need to do it in this particular way. Maybe I would prefer to do it differently. Uh, so that in a lo long run, especially in those people with certain predispositions, that will be cause of big stress. And with big stress over time, we have burnout. Then we have this um, appropriate awards. So different people expect different awards. For many of us, the awards is the change, like to see that something is changing, like that our efforts are bringing change. And since times of crisis, many times we can't see the change in our generation even. So that causes a lot of stress. And we tend to put even more pressure on ourselves because we don't see it. That means that we're not doing enough and that is even bigger stress. So that is a, a bit of a problem. Also, there is also, there is often a problem of nobody seeing what I'm doing. There is no recognition of what is happening. And like, I might not be here, like nobody cares. This is, I'm so sorry, my cat is talking to me and I would love to get him out, but he's very bad in that regard. So he, uh, so when it comes to the awards, this is something that we can, we can fix often as people, not only as leaders, but also as people, a person to person connection. Um, then we have the loss of sense of positive connection with others. And this is extremely important when it comes to activists because often our organization, our community is our family. Often this is the place when we seek understanding. This is the only place when anybody can understand us. So when everything else, every five, every other five mismatches are, uh, are there uh, and still there is a sense of positive connection, and belonging, we might stay, and the burnout won't be that hard for us. So um, I think this is our superpower as uh, as NGOs, as activists, as communities. Um, the connection, the connection with others. Um, then uh, we have again this organizational uh, mismatch, this perceived lack of fairness. This is of course subjective, and everybody has their own truth. But fairness is being understood as I get respect, I get trust to my actions, and there is openness in, uh, in the organization as well. So if there is no fairness, there, there is no sense of respect, there is no trust in what I can do or who I am, and there is no openness for us as humans, like that makes it, um, that makes it the lack of fairness. And then um, the conflict of values, which is quite important for activists is when for example, when the personal values are in conflict with what I do. So I had this a bit, and quite often actually, when I felt like I am focusing more on donors than on the change, for instance, and that I can see that in long run that might contribute to, to, to what I want to do, but Truly, I feel that I'm just pleasing somebody else instead of doing the right stuff. There is also the problem with writing reports when I know that sometimes I'm painting a picture that is way nicer, that is actually the truth. So there is this sense of being a bit of a hypocrite or being forced to act against my values sometimes as well. So this is, again, um, a cause of stress and in long run, also a cause of burnout. Um, so, so are there any questions about that so far? Um, there's one more, apart from the one I already uh, read. Um, uh, Tatiana asked, what if I feel guilty when I ask, leave me alone, I guess, is what. Of course. That is a beautiful question. Yes, uh, so there is, this, uh, there is this sense that we cannot set boundaries, like that we, we should be there all the time. And if we are not, we're failing. And um, not only this, uh, but also we're failing our community, for example. Uh, when there are people that are taking care of, um, of animals in the shelter, uh, when they're not there, who will be? And this is the sense of, oh my God, this, 
that's that's the end. Uh, that's the end of um, of the cause. Like like my mission will be failed. And if you feel guilty um, or ashamed, the best way and I I don't know any other better way. Go and talk about it. Like speak about it to somebody you trust because this shame grows in isolation and guilt grows in isolation you're not doing anything wrong so it's great to have external source that somebody will tell you this is okay you have all the right to be tired you have all the right to uh, take some time off we need you alive because if you're not alive, you won't be contributing anymore. And we need you. So uh, you might think about it in this kind of rational management of yourself. Like if I'm not taking this time for myself, I will not able to come back in 10 days or I will get in the hospital. Like burnout as, as a consequence for health is a real thing. It's, it's uh, high blood pressure, it's heart attacks, like really a lot of uh, serious diseases. So it's not like we're just having fun here and just trying to find burnout. So if that helps, that you're actually finding something bigger by taking some time off for you, that is great. But if you feel more and more ashamed of that you need this time, Talk to somebody, talk to a friend. I'm pretty sure more people around you is going through the same thing. So uh, that actually really leads me uh, to, um, to the, I think in two more slides we'll get there. So I will come back to that uh, in a second. So activism and uh, how, what, what are the specific issues in activism? Uh, so let's start with the triangle, with the permanent austerity. We are constantly lacking resources, time, people, everything. Like, I don't know any organization that is happy with what they have. There is always not enough because the world requires a lot of changes. And this is something that not many other sectors understand. I think like maybe health sector, for example, yeah, they might understand it very much. Uh, but uh, in our, our reality is really harsh. And dealing with that stress, that is all, it's never enough. I, I don't even say it's never too much. It's never enough. Uh, and we often we need to make really, really difficult choices uh, on who to help and what to do what needs to what needs to come first and what what need to be the second so uh so this is the the difficult reality um of um of activists on the other side for many people it's their whole life there is no work life balance in that regard because there is there is life and often again if my community is my family. This is even more of my life. So uh, that takes a toll. Because there is no way I can go out and take and take some breath outside of what I do of what of of this activism part of my life. So div diversification all, always helps. I know it's super hard for many people in the NGO world. And then we have two uh, things that are um, specific to certain, um, to certain organizations and certain activism. So compassion, uh, compassion fatigue comes when we need to, when we are exposed every day to somebody, somebody else's suffering. When we are in this caregiver sector, when we need to solve troubles of other people and we are all the time exposed to their stress and we do it with heart and that's amazing but there is nobody that like often it's not being told to anybody that it also causes stress to you and you need like you need to deal with the stress as well it doesn't just go away so after certain uh certain time many people starts to be 
starts to disconnect. Um, so they started with a lot of heart, they put a lot of heart, and then you're kind of resigning on, on, on empathy and compassion. So uh, being tired of being all the time there for everybody. Um, and this is also something that causes enormous amounts of stress to people. And then the moral injury, which we can say it's just this feeling of helplessness when we don't have enough of resources, which is constant, and we just see more and more people and animals in need, it can, at a certain point, just freeze us. Like, so what can I do? Like, no matter what I'm doing, I'm not just not doing enough. There is always something more that requires my attention. Uh, so this helplessness and this, uh, this feeling of defeat uh, is not that rare. So being exposed to enormous traumas, for example, people that are working with refugees, people that are in the war zones, on the front line, this is not easy to be permanently exposed to trauma. So there are also ways to kind of manage it a bit. I, I'm here, I will focus on what, can you, on what you can do yourself, but I really recommend working with somebody who is professional in that regard, uh, so not to, miss, not, not to miss on important points and not to hurt yourself, uh, yourself more, possibly. Okay, so there is the saying, like, put your own oxygen mask first, but what does it mean in practice? And like we all know, this is me having a lot of fun in a very empty uh, plane. So I asked the, the flight assistants to uh, borrow me the, uh, the oxygen mask. I just um, wanted to say, yeah, great photo. Amazing selfie, I know. I'm so talented. Um, so what does it mean in practice? Because it's easy to say. Of course, like put your own oxygen mask first before assisting others. So there is a logic in that. If you're dead, you won't be able to assist others. So I don't know why it's so easy for us to forget about it. And I would say the best managers and the best leaders, they understand that dead activists are not the activists that are bringing change. Uh, so this is something that seems obvious, but what does it mean? So I want to reverse it, and uh, Natalia Sarata, who is here, she is also a big promoter of um, this idea that it's not about my oxygen mask first, but it's about our own, our oxygen masks. We all deserve oxygen masks. So what is radical in thinking that we should care about each other is that the whole culture around self-care and well-being is telling us it's an individual problem, but also it, the, the culture is telling us not to notice when people are burning out. So we can see people coming to work when being sick and sneezing and being exhausted and being tired and unhappy and really not the rays of sunshine that we would like to work with. And yet we're not telling anything like we're not saying anything and just yeah this is normal so it can be a bit of tough love and saying like just go away and just take some time and until we're not saying it out loud until we're not changing this culture this will be radical and is as sad as possible because it's so logical again uh, if we are not taking care of everybody around us, we will be left alone. Like we'll be left alone. Like there will be if I am happy and not burn out, and everybody else is they're burning out. Is also that doesn't also serve the cause. Uh, so that's the second thing I want to I want you to remember. Let's just break the silence of burning out, and let's not take care only of ourselves, but let's just speak out loud that we need to take care of all of us because we need more people, not less. Um, yeah, that was my manifesto. Uh, so stress management, because there was a lot of 
uh, of stress uh, mentioned. So one thing that I want to um, that I want to say uh, is that um, stress may be perceived as bad, and this is what we were what we were taught for a very long time. But the newest research is actually saying that our perception of stress as such might influence whether the stress will be harmful, for example, to our bodies. So um, this is quite well optimistic. Uh, but it's very hard to break the habit of thinking that stress is bad for us. Well, stress releases adrenaline. Adrenaline is great. The problem is when this adrenaline becomes cortisol and that might, that might be harming our bodies. So there is this amazing book that I want to show you. This is the book by um, Dr. Emily and Amelia Nagoski. So this is Burnout, the Secret, the secret to Solving the Stress Cycle. And I want to tell you about sol uh, uh, solving the stress cycle. So this is the first, um, uh, the first, oh, let's say square. Um, it's about the thing that even if we deal with the stressor, so for example, we fix our broken wheel, uh, the stress is still in our body because evo evolutionary, our bodies are not really understanding the modern world. In the old world, it was like, oh my God, there is lion, let's run to my village, and then like they will help me to kill the lion and we will have um, a party all together. So here, in 21st century, it doesn't really work like that, and our bodies are just really confused. So they keep the stress inside. Not only they keep our stress inside, but also in this compassion fatigue, they keep the stress from other people inside as well. So what we need, like the first absolutely self-care is to close the cycle and to say like, let's have the party after killing the lion. As a vegetarian, I have troubles with, with this example, but like, I will change it for the next webinar. Uh, so this like, the danger is done. Like for today, I'm safe at home. What is helpful? So there are, it, it's basic science. So the body knows that the, uh, the, the, the danger is, is out when um, sports is one of the things uh, that, that help. Breathing is helping um, in the way of like this deep, deep breath, like down to your stomach as much as you can. Some people with trauma would have big troubles with, with breathing deeply, but as much as you can and also focusing on the breath. Um, and of course, like, I refer you to any mindfulness training in that regard. What else is helping our body recognize that we're not in danger anymore is actually positive social interactions. And it doesn't mean like with our close ones. It means like saying, saying hello to somebody on the street, like being nice to your neighbors, like showing your body and like this kind of old part of the brain that the world is a positive, friendly place. This is, this is the um, positive social interaction, doesn't need to be big. Laughter is amazing evolutionary mechanism for our bodies to release stress, as much as crying is as well. So it's even recommended if you have this movie that makes you cry or the advertisement that makes you cry and you feel like the day had a lot of stress, go ahead, watch it, and just release the stress with crying. Laughter, yes, like your favorite comedy, also amazing. So affection uh, is also helping. And affection, for example, that's why at the recent conference that, uh, that we were all together, um, there is this way, hug somebody who you can hug for 20 seconds. Because 20 seconds is like, a very awkward hug with somebody you don't know and a good thing with somebody that you know and you can trust and this is like sometimes it, it needs to be a bit more sometimes it will be a bit less but like it's this 20 seconds is a really awkward period for for somebody we don't know so that means if you let yourself hug somebody for 20 seconds it means that it's safe um, the same like if you have a significant other, uh, you can kiss for six seconds. 
six seconds is actually quite a long kiss. Uh, not six times for like one second, but like all at least six seconds. So that also shows your body it's safe. You can release. I can see Maya. Uh, then, uh, yeah, and creativity. Because often creativity and creative um, acts are the only socially acceptable uh, ways of showing our emotions. So this is great way. And now you don't need to do all of them. You try whichever works for you. Sport is by far the best, uh, but maybe you don't like sports. There are people like this and I'm not really a big fan. Sometimes I am, but like sometimes it's not the right thing. And sometimes you don't have time for it. What is important is to remember that we need to close the cycle basically every day. So if you wonder what to do in terms of um, stress control, put aside some time every day to let your body know that it's safe. And we know that we'll come back to the same stressors, but at least for the day, the body will be able to relax. Okay, that was that was big. I totally recommend this book. This is amazing. It says like it's for women, but 70% of this book is helpful for every single human being on this planet. And it's full on science. So really zero, like if you're not too spiritual, which is one of my characteristics, this is like pure science. Um, then uh, let's go into the meaning. So if you have the meaning of your life and you know what is the big purpose, it's easy to decide if suffering certain stress is worth it or not. So it justifies sometimes that, um, okay, I will do it because I know it serves my purpose. And if it's your own conscious decision, it is definitely way less stress. And I have tons of stories of the same stressor, like for example, a very tight time or dealing with very annoying people. And before it was like, I have no choice. I won't find any other place on earth that will accept me. I need to stay there, so I'm trapped basically. And then coming back with another perspective of, okay, I understand why I need to do that. So I'm taking it, I'm embracing this fight, and I know why. And that was so much less stress, and it was so much more empowering for people. So meaning helps you navigate, definitely how to make the decision. Also, it helps you navigate, or like make the decision if you want to stay somewhere or not. Because you might at a certain point say, like, no, this is not worth it, and just go. It will not erase the meaning, it will just help you make the decision. Then if sometimes, okay, not sometimes, very often we have very high expectations. So that puts a lot of pressure and there is this uh, problem with never delivering enough. So redefi redefining what is the win, what is the success? really helps in managing stress. So, and also brings you the sense of achievement when uh, basically you know that you're going towards the purpose, but the steps are smaller, but also are achievable. So you see the progress that takes away the sense of defeat. I will get to that in the next and the last slide. Uh, so managing expectations makes a lot of sense in not burning out, basically. If your expectations are high, if you want too much, too fast, it's basically like creating a perfect environment for, for burning out. Or even if, unfortunately, you will get rewards for being too ambitious, too, too ambitious, too fast, and so on. Like, so then, know yourself and set boundaries. And this is extremely hard. It's a beautiful small square, but it's a, for many of us, it's a lo lifelong work. Listen to your body and your emotions. Yes. So easy to say, so difficult to do. Many of us, we don't even know that we have emotions. Like sometimes we have anger that mostly men or like sadness for, for women. 
there, those are like socially acceptable. But there is a range of emotions. Uh, and listening to them and also listening to the body, that is obviously telling you just please slow down, be good to me. I see, thank you, Maya. And this is following what the mind, body, and emotions is telling you will help you make decisions whether you're at the edge of burning out or maybe if you can go a bit further on. This is absolutely amazing for setting the boundaries and having this um, clear benchmark. I can't do that anymore. I need my time. And if you trust yourself, uh, that is also helpful for not feeling guilty for asking for help, for asking for time off, uh, because you just know that you're at the edge and that you also deserve this time uh, because you did whatever you could. Um, so this is about stress and now a bit about this moral injury protocol. So when we feel defeated, which, ha which happens quite a lot. So the first step is really hard. Because admitting it is hard is really not in, actually in, in any culture that I know. In the Western industrialized culture, in, in many Asian cultures, like we need to win. And you don't whine, don't be a crybaby. Like just go and fight. So admitting that it's hard out loud, first to yourself and then out loud, is really helpful because only then you can do something about it. That you feel defeated, that it's so difficult to carry on. Uh, so no matter what, I really recommend talking to other people, having communities that will support you, that will most probably share your experience because probably you're not the only one there. So the guilt and shame, they grow in isolation. So speaking about troubles helps in not feeling like the worst activist in the world. And then, again, we come back to the meaning because it helps to find strength in this meaning. Like you have something bigger, you have the bigger purpose to carry on. That's why, for example, mothers are so super strong because they have this bigger purpose. And um, that might be the start to guide you to stand up basically but then the important part and this is something that you can do for yourself is assess your strengths and resources so your strengths i mean like what you have in you what are your talents what are the good thing about you what are the stuff that you already done and then see what external resources you have what are other people that you have that might help you in defeating the defeat, like in fighting the defeat. And just take it as a toolbox for carrying on. But this is a very important step to have this self-awareness in the stuff that you're good at. There is a reason you're in the place you're, you're in, like it's not uh, your beginnings as an activist, for example. So you already have a lot in your toolbox. Just go and look again at the toolbox and be also not modest, uh, that's especially for women. Just be true what you really can do and what is truly there in your toolbox. And then in order to fight the defeat, in order to fight the hopelessness, start doing something even something that will bring you one millimeter closer to your vision. Um, because that kind of reverses the sense of hopelessness. Like there is nothing we can do. No, we can do at least this one super teeny tiny thing. And so from my example as, um, as a very burnout activist some time ago, sometimes it was really making my bed. So I got up and that was my really one thing. And carrying on with really small stuff when you really burn out is something that is helpful. Like just knowing that you can do something. So if 
you feel like you can't do anything, again, I seriously recommend to go to an expert, a specialist, to, to a psych, uh, psychotherapist, to talk to a doctor. Because if you can't do that, uh, you might just need some help. And that's absolutely okay. We don't need to be alone in our struggle. So for the last moment, because I know there are also besides this book that I highly recommend again, Emily Nagoski, it's a very new book. Um, I have some stuff that I also want to recommend. So if coming back to this emotion thing, I totally recommend Dr. Guy Vinch uh, about emotional uh, first aid. Of how to understand your I will like we will make a list so uh, no, yeah that's list. what I wanted to propose yeah. we'll list all the books and then email with a link to the recording. yes that, that doesn't mean, mean I won't I won't show them now yeah uh, exactly so uh, so there is this emotional first uh, first aid it also helps you recognize the difficult emotions and tells you what to do with it. And I, this is a small book on grief, so how to fix a broken heart. And it's just full on really do it yourself, uh, emotional help. So very much recommended. This guy has also a TED talk, uh, so you can watch it, but the books are highly recommended. And then there is a book uh, that is called Happy Healthy Nonprofit. And in this book, and also in uh, on their website, you can find the find the self assessment uh, about where is your passion as an activist. So this book is more about organizational level, so this we care, and on the sense of like in the organization as well, rather from American perspective or like let's say medium up to big organizations, but it's very, uh, very useful uh, in a lot of self-help, self-care um, recommendations. Uh, so yeah, those are the, the, the four books that I definitely recommend when it comes to um, burnout and nonprofits. How about now? There were, if you have any uh, additional ones, but maybe we'll come back to the first one that was asked. I feel like you answered it. Um, you started to answer it, but maybe uh, it's an, I think it's important for a lot of people, uh, which is uh, what are the best ways to communicate it with employers and colleagues? This is what you talk about a lot without risking discrimination at work. I think employers might be. More so first of all, like uh, I would definitely recommend going to a doctor and asking for um, just medical recommendation because there is no bigger authority, I would say, than um, than this uh, than doctors' authority. And burnout is a medical uh, issue as well, so it's th that might be that might be one. The other thing is there's. A lot of stigma on mental health unfortunately so that's why I'm advocating talking about like changing the culture in that regard and I don't have a universal um, recommendation what to do in here because I see it rather as a process but honestly stand proud to just being tired and burned out and asking for um, time off or for whatever you need because maybe there are some other stressors that uh, that are influencing your life so setting boundaries and embracing them helps a lot finding allies so not being alone in this fight helps a lot as well and often maybe sometimes bringing additional materials uh, just to show that this is a real issue because people might not know that Emotional health and the, co the um, consequences of burnout might not be a common knowledge yet, as well. Um, Matthew has a question, um, and maybe you can help. Any suggestions on how to support a colleague going through burnout? Definitely normalizing their feelings and helping them in not feeling guilty or ashamed 
that's for sure. Not uh, so. Sometimes we say, oh, we miss you so much. There is so much to do. I would say this is not the best way of communicating that we miss a person at work, telling him or her that there is more work waiting for, for them. So uh, making sure that they are still feeling important, even if very tired and exhausted. I don't know if this person is still uh, with you uh, at um, at the place where, where you work together or is this person already, I don't know, on sabbatical or on medical leave. But if this person is at work, listen to uh, to the tiredness talking and also when needed, push them out for them to get help. Some tough love sometimes, unfortunately, is needed. Not only bubbles and fluffy bunnies. No fluffy bunnies. Sometimes fluffy bunnies are amazing, but uh, sometimes it's better to be harsher. I know some people that are coming to work when sick. Well, I don't know what you mean. I don't know Me what neither. you're mentioning. No, no, because she's making a. Uh, that's that was that comment was to me. Um, any other questions? I think also I can I can share with you because I don't know if everybody saw. Um, Kyle had a comment while you were talking about resting and taking a rest. Uh, she wrote in, we often treat rest as a kind of reward and pleasure that you can take only after finishing your tasks, but we should treat it as a hygiene and, and maintenance necessary to be able to keep effectiveness in the long term. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. This is like golden words. Taking time off is just normal need of the body. So humans, not robots. Like if our computer is dying without charging, we're charging it. And there is no excuse. We don't feel guilty about it. It's normal. While when we need to charge, it's like, oh, maybe not now. Maybe in an hour, maybe in a week. In a week, I'm going for vacations for two days. So this is like, we, if we treat ourselves like our mobile phones, I think we will be so much better. Um, maybe we have time. Some people are already leaving, and of course, we understand you have other engagements. But maybe time for one last question. Does anyone? I'm sure you have a lot, but maybe one that you want to share and have Anka answer. Uh, how do you deal with procrastination? That's a great question, <laughs> actually. Uh, While so, taking care of yourself, that's the other part. Uh, again, it's a great question because procrastination is not laziness. Procrastination usually is um, a sign that there is there are some unpleasant feelings behind doing something. And if we live in a culture that is punishing us for taking time off and for resting and for taking care of ourselves, obviously we want to avoid it because we want to be strong and like we want to just go there. And this is what is expected from us. So this, taking this time, you need to be radical. And we don't really, like being radical is, is it has a social cost. So that's why we might not like doing that. What I recommend is having a community that will push you for that. So you're not alone in being radical and just spreading the message. Um, I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. Those are really great questions. And thank you, Anka, obviously. Um, and uh, thank all of you, thank you all that attended. And we'll be, uh, like I mentioned, we'll be sending an email where you'll find all the important links, all the book titles that Anka recommended, and uh, as well as links to podcasts and previous uh, webinars. I just want to, uh, can I just uh, one more time uh, say that? For Polish people, Natalia Sarata is doing an amazing job with Regeneractia. Please find it on Facebook, and Natalia, if you can type it, uh, because I think this is really great for Polish people. Like You will find amazing stuff. Uh, 
like every week. So uh, we'll uh, add it to, we'll uh, add it to the email. Yes, yes. I think like we need to support each other. <laughs> Thank you all for coming again. See you soon, hopefully. Thank you.